everybody, Adam Savage, and I am in one of my favorite places, the Jim Henson Creature Shop in Los Angeles with Bobby. And sir, it's so nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. You are a construction supervisor for dozers. Is that is that a reasonable approximation of a of one of your titles? Yeah, one of my uh, jobs was to basically re not redesign, but take the original designs yeah. and bring them more into the, the 20th century. Um, because uh, Muppets, we, we think of Muppets as a textile-based construction, and these guys are, while there are textiles involved, their main bodies are not sewn. They're not sewn, they're not made like that. No, we actually, um, the originals were sculpted right. and made out of foam latex and flocked just like these were, but today we have the luxury of computers. And especially when you're doing high volume puppets like the Doozers, I mean, there's hundreds of them. Yeah. And also the scale of them, the smaller something is, the harder it is to work on it and to make it. So with the luxury of computers, you can build everything. You can sculpt the, the character, sculpt the head. You can sculpt the hat, size the hat. That way you know you can print a glove on this machine, a hat on this machine, right. the body on this machine, and they're all gonna fit together. Now, when you say that the body is foam latex, you don't mean a sort of like a like mattress material. It's something lighter than that. Is that correct? It's like a makeup sponge almost? Exactly like a makeup sponge, um, except we control the thickness of it. The, 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 the actual how sturdy thickness it is? of the skin. If it's too thick, um, it might not bend correctly. If it's too thin, oh. you might get a weird wrinkle in, a, in an arm. So you tune it to get that fleshy. And even the heads um, have full animatronics inside, so you would need to have a very thin skin to accommodate all the mechs inside the head. And it used to be that some somebody or a group of individuals was sculpting, may I lift this guy? Absolutely. Was sculpting every one of these bodies from scratch. Then you're making plaster molds, you're injecting these with latex. When now that you're using the computer, are you 3D printing the molds? In this case, we 3D printed. Oh, oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> I kept it from falling. So we 3D printed the body, yeah. body shopped it, and then made a traditional mold of it. Okay, like a standard um, plaster mold. Because they had to go through the the oven process, because you have to bake the of foam course. latex in the oven. And we're at that time we weren't exactly we hadn't workshopped molds to go through that process sure. yet. Oh my God, I'm pulling um, off this boot. That is, I'm sorry, I did derail, but that is so freaking cute. And this is a great example of how it would have been done on the original show. They would have been latex, cast latex, right. hands and gloves and, and shoes. Whereas now we 3D print each hand. Oh. And what's cool about this is that you can sculpt one hand and then have a bunch of different poses. Because you can do that all in the computer. And then we added mag magnets to each one so that as you're on set, you may need different poses. Maybe he's pointing, yeah, yeah. or maybe she has a cup of coffee, so you can pop off a hand. Oh! And then maybe now she has a flashlight. Let's see. And you can light up any one of these appliances they're holding. And what's cool is yeah, in the computer, after you sculpt the flashlight, you can add a channel so that your LED can go through. So then when you're on set, you get all in camera. Oh, and then they can go on their little adventure. And, and so in these hands are... I mean, obviously there might be different sizes of doozers, but these hands are interchangeable for anyone that's correct. the correct size. And uh, that brings up a good point with the body is back in the old days, yeah. <laughs> if you had sculpted this body and then there was a little change, you'd have to re-sculpt that body. Right, right, Whereas right. now you can go into the computer and with a few little tweaks, you can very quickly do multiple different body styles so that they're not exactly the same. Even the baby, you know, you can just shrink it down and now you have a baby. Right, right. Okay, so now it's got its body, you've molded it in the latex. Can you describe to me the process of the flocking, the way in which you guys put these tiny hairs on these guys? Because it seems like magic to me. So you would start with something kind of like this, a uh, bare skin, it would yeah. be foam latex, and your mechs would be inside of it. And then it's, uh, it's a special kind of glue, it's flock glue that you would paint on, and then you use static electricity. And it's this gun, a wand, and they have to hook up, and you have to hook up your positive and negative. Um, so on like, the creature itself. Correct. So you get a charge going through it. Mm -hmm. And then in your wand that you have in your basket, you have flock. 
And as you shoot the flock out, it kind of flies through the air. And all these little hairs line up. And they stick up straight, like like when you have, uh, when you get scared and your hair stands up, yeah. same effect. <laughs> so. That's amazing that that works and that you can touch them and it doesn't just wear off. Yep. You just sometimes perform these characters and like chat with them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I mean, when you're building, building a, a puppet for months at a time, like, yeah. you inevitably sit there and play with it. Amazing. <laughs> it's like a twofer. <laughs> yeah. um, so the process has gotten a lot faster for iterating these guys. Yes. Are you guys looking at other technologies for improving or changing some of these things to even increase that efficiency? It truly is like a weekly sort of thing. Like really? each week there's some new technology that comes out. Um, and so we use a lot of kind of non-traditional ways of doing these things, stuff, techniques that you would never even think of. Um, and, and the trick really is, is to make it still look homemade yeah. and still have that Henson kind of hominess. On it. It's very textile. It Interesting. That that hominess is sort of like a, a, a it, it makes it, it makes you know that it's handmade, and that's sort of right. like a hug. Exactly, and it, it's a very uniquely Henson sort of thing. So it's there is a balance when you start to use technology because you don't want it to be, you don't want it to look like what you've done to it. Wow. It still has to have that. You have to connect to it yeah. as a character. Now you have a really interesting origin story here. Yes. You arrived at Henson via a television show. I did. Can, can you tell me a little bit about this? Because I'm fascinated. So it was 10 years ago. Um, I was working with Imagineering in Orlando. Yeah. And a friend of a friend kind of said, hey, I saw this ad. You should apply to it. Um, one thing led to another. I ended up on the show. And I won. And now it's been 10 years. This is you won the Jim Henson Creature Chop Challenge. Yes. <laughs> okay. When you first started working here, I'm curious about the first piece of institutional knowledge that blew your mind wide open. Like you already understood the Henson thing and you had like immersed yourself in it, but you've arrived here in the, in the shop and someone says, Oh, here's how we do this. Like, was there a piece of knowledge that was really surprising? Um, so I did not come from the film world. Okay. I came from the theme park world. And the closest thing that I'd ever gotten to a movie prop or a puppet or anything like that was, you know, I collected a few things here and there, but sure. I'd never really been around actual props. Yeah. And it's kind of a shock, especially if you collect, you get that piece and you're like, this is like, this is the thing. Cause oh, they yeah, they're all. It, it, you always imagine it to be so much more. And these are a great example, actually, because when I was a kid, I assumed doozers were this big. Oh, right, of course. And I thought the fraggles were this big. <laughs> and it was kind of like when I first saw them, it's like, well, of course they would be that size, but that kind of ruins. <laughs> my, I was like, I, in my mind, there's a different world. So it, I think it's always the, the, the straightest line. Yeah. Sometimes you don't have to go above and beyond. Like the simplest thing is usually what's going to work the best. And uh, I think that's, especially coming from a theme park world where you over-engineer everything. Right, right. I thought that was a, a very unique kind of concept to, to just think as simple as possible. Because especially if you're on set and you're trying to get a shot, like you don't want something that's super complicated. Yeah. Like sometimes just a simple rod or a simple hand puppet is all you need. That sense that they're like overly large to you when you first arrive, that also means that you're a little closer to the magic, a little closer to the, the suspension of disbelief. Right. Does that ever happen when you're working on these guys? Like one of them starts to talk to you, hi, Bobby, and you just start chatting back? Uh, it's very surreal at yeah. moments, especially like Dark Crystal is another great example where, yeah. you know, I... I remember when I was a kid, it would come on PBS every Saturday and they would play the making of before. And I never really got through the movie, but I would watch the making of every time Amazing. all the way through. And uh, that was one of the projects I got to work on was Age of Resistance. And it, it, it really was kind of a, a surreal, you know, you're in it. You're actually doing this thing that you wanted to do when you were a kid. You know, right. you've worked to get to this point and you actually are doing it. It's, it's I, wild. I believe in some time, in some, in some, 
It's reasonable to describe my life as a lifelong escapade to maybe someday build Agra's orrery from the first <laughs> Dark Crystal, right? right? Like, it's just like, that's such a powerful moment to me. Um, I love these characters. There's, so, it's, there's something about seeing them all with their parts that doesn't take away the magic. It actually adds it. Adds it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite piece of equipment? One that kicked your butt or one that you're just like, soup, makes you smile every time you see it? I see you've got these like, I see you guys are using a little bit of absolutely every technique, 3D printing here for these guys. This is, yeah, this is a great example. Um, this was modeled on the computer, uh, printed, and then you can see here, here's kind of a final piece. Oh, there it is. And the caulk gun was printed out of a clear acrylic. Oh my God, it's a caulk gun. That's hilarious. And that will just bolt right on Correct. there. There you go. Amazing. And if you look on the inside, uh, just like Scott showed with the, the fraggle hands, yeah. this is the rod. Um, for Point, controlling. Right. Gotcha. So you stick that on and then you stick the the rod in. Oh, thank now you. Oh, that feels good. Incredible. Bobby, thank you so much for this tour. Absolutely. It, seeing these guys up close, just even more enjoyable. They're such lovely characters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.